Today we are blessed to be concluding our series and our study of the book of Jude, and we will be studying today verses 24 and verses 25. If you have your Bible with you, you can open it up and go to verse 24 and 25 or your Bible app. And it is, as, as Taylor has already said, it is, a, it is a, a doxology. But I want to say in addition to it being a doxology, these last two verses in the book of Jude are, I think, two of the most encouraging verses that you will find in the Bible. I've been really blessed to be thinking on these two verses and studying these two verses. And I want you to know, church, I actually sleep better at night because of these two verses. And um, I want to explain this to you before we even start to unpack them today. I want us to see why I find these two verses so comforting. Um, I just want to just, I want to share some, some heartfelt things today um, that I've really thought about. Um, maybe you've been coming to this service for quite a while or this church, and maybe you've noticed that generally before I preach, I often say something like this, I'm glad to see you, or I'm grateful for you. Maybe you've heard that so much, maybe you think that's just a filler, that maybe that's kind of like me clearing my throat, maybe it's just something I'm in the habit of doing, and so you're like, that's just Travis, that's how he begins his messages, but I want you to know that it's not a filler, and that I've actually thought through it, and um, I do it for a reason. I do it for two reasons, really, and it has really a lot to do with the verses that we're going to look at today. I do it for, for two main reasons. The first reason is I really am grateful for each and every one of you, and I want you to know that. I want you to know that this time together that we have is the apex. It's the height of my week. All week long, it's been great anticipation, and, and I'm just so grateful to see you. The second reason I say this, and I want you to hear me as I work through this, is that um, it's a reminder to me it's a reminder to me. I need to be reminded of certain truths before I even begin to preach the word of God. And so it reminds me that none of you are here today to hear me or my opinion. You're not here because of me. I need to be reminded of that. I need to be reminded. It's by the grace of God that you're here. It's by the grace of God that I am here. And here's something I want to share with all of you, something that I have struggled with, and the Lord's been kind to me, but there's something I've struggled with ever since the day the Lord called me to be a proclaimer of the message. He called me into the, the ministry. Here's what I've struggled with, and it has everything to do with what these two verses are going to talk about today. I've struggled with this. I've struggled with, I've struggled with this understanding and maybe it, I've been strong with the understanding of trying to, to see that, man, I don't carry this, right? Like in the back of my head, since the first sermon I've ever preached, I've always thought that perhaps this time that I'm preaching will be the last time anyone attends the church at all, right? That's what I think in the back of my head. Like, 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 like why would anyone want to be a member of a church where God might call me to be a preacher. And even today as I'm coming, I'm thinking, eh, this, this might be, I might, might be the, the last time. Maybe this is going to be the weekend that you discover that this isn't the church for you. Or I'm not the pastor that you think that you need to be sitting under. And so, you know, I, I struggle with that and carrying that and thinking about it. Um, I remember when I was, we were in Africa. Once again, true story, we're in Africa and Dar es Salaam, and, and Dar es Salaam is a primarily Muslim kind of setting, right? And it's, it, it's just a tough place to be and, and as far as preaching the gospel. And we're sitting there, we're part of a team, we're planting the church, and by God's grace, it is growing, it is growing, and people keep coming. And I'm preaching, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, if a handful of people show up, that's awesome. But every week, the Lord keeps bringing more and, and more people, and, and sometimes as they come, I just want to just stop them and say, I think you got the wrong building. Now, did you understand who's going to be preaching today? It was me, and, and I'd preach, and i think, man, surely next week no one's going to come. And so you kind of think on that. I think I struggle with that. 
I struggle on that because she, she said, guys, guys, I know me. I know me better than any of you. I know the thoughts I think. I know the things that I do. I know I'm prone to stumble. Truth be known, and this is going to hook into what we're going to look at today. Truth be known, I am amazed that I am still stirred by the word of God. It amazes me. I am amazed by the fact that my love for the church continues to grow. I'm going to tell you a fact, and this is the truth, man. I love the church more today than I loved it last week. It amazes me. In fact, you want to see me get upset? Come talk bad about the church around me. Man, it'll rile me up. You kick the church? You kick the church? Man, it gets me upset. And that's why I find such great comfort in these two verses. Because what we're going to see today, and I've been thinking on this, what we're going to see today is that if my faith in Jesus and if my eagerness to know him and his word and if my love for the church was dependent decisively on me, I would have ceased to be a Christian a long time ago. If I was the decisive factor in all of this, if it was me, I would cease to be fit for the ministry. I would cease to be fit for heaven. If I was a decisive cause, it would not come because it can't. But praise be to the living God that these two verses that we're going to look at tells me that the God that saved me and the God that called me is a God that will keep me he is a God that will hold me, and he is a God that will deliver me. So I need not worry about anyone attending a church where the Lord would place me. And I need not worry about you to a degree. I want to shepherd you well, but ultimately, I know I'm not the decisive factor. God is, and he's good, and he's faithful, and I'm telling you, it helps me sleep better at night. Oh, this is one incredible doxology. But I want us, after we finish today looking at these two verses, I want us to delight ourselves in these comforting words. So I'm going to read it, and then we're going to unpack it. And, I, and, and my prayer has been that you too will sleep better because these two verses exist. Here's what Jude says, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Straight up, church, I have less gray hair because of these two verses they are so comforting. There are two grand comforting um, truths that we're going to see here, and we're going to just unpack them one by one, and you're going to see some other comforting truths really supporting these grand truths. But here's the first grand truth that I want us to see today, and it's this, what God accomplishes for us. We want to see this because it will help you sleep better, man. Here's what he says, verse 24. I just want to read it again. I want to hammer this in our heads. So maybe at night, you know, you're worrying. You're worrying about um, 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 if you're going to make it, if you're going to sustain, if all you're worried. I want you to repeat this verse in your head. Listen, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. There are three staggering truths to be found in here. Three, first, we see God is able to keep us. Church, I want to say that again. I want to say it clearly. God is able to keep us. Verse 24, I'm just going to hit it again. And now to him who is able to keep you, believer, from stumbling. We're told unequivocally, God will keep us from stumbling. I mean, you, gotta, I mean that, you know what a relief that is? Delight yourself in that God is perfectly faithful. 
He is supremely powerful. He is infinitely loving, and he will not allow those whom he has saved to lose their eternal, their saving faith. It's called the doctrine of eternal security. I find great comfort in it. Why? Once again, because I know this. If I was the decisive cause of myself being faithful to Christ, I would not stand a chance. I wouldn't. If I was the decisive, now I'm involved in this, but I am not the decisive factor in this. And I thought, I remember, I remember when the Lord saved me. I remember that. It was beautiful. The Lord saved me, and I heard the gospel. The guy told me the Lord saved me. It was tremendous. After that, man, I'm delighting myself in my God. I'm delighting myself in my salvation, right? And I remember this. I remember this distinctly. I remember a friend of mine, he comes up to me, all right? Maybe you have a similar friend. And I had to help educate him. But anyway, he comes up to me. He told me something I never even thought about. He said, hey, you do, he said, I'm, glad, I'm glad the Lord saved you. I'm glad it's going good for you. Hey, but Travis, check it out, man. You got to be careful. You got to be careful, Travis, because you might lose it. Church, I want to tell you something. That terrified me. It terrified me because, you see, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was that salvation. And now this guy's coming up into me, and he's telling me that I can lose my salvation like I lose a remote control for a television set, which I lost every week. Terrified me. Praise God, the people, the church I was in was encouraging me to read my Bible because I was. And I remember, man... I remember I came across this passage, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I don't know if you remember the first time you read that passage. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm, so yeah, the first time I read that passage, I remember reading it. Man, I'm doing backflips, right? It is a tremendous passage. I just want to read it to you. I read this. I'm worried. This guy said, man, you can lose this. And I'm like, oh, man, I got some. If anyone could lose, hey, church, if anyone could lose their salvation, I would be the first one to lose it. I want you to know that. But I get to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. I read that. I'm like, yes! I knew I didn't do it. I couldn't have merited this. It's, 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 it's amazing. Not a result of your works so that no one may bo boast. I was, <laughs> guys, I remember reading that. And I'm like, yeah, oh boy. I'm calling my boy up. I was like, dude, you been reading your Bible? Because I just found something, and I want you to check it out. You see, here's the thing. Yeah, I may, I may lose my remote control to my television set, but I'm telling you, according to what I'm reading, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and I've learned many other beautiful verses like we're reading today, I ain't losing my salvation. Because I didn't do anything to get it. Because I couldn't. And if it could be lost, I would have already lost it. Now, real quick, I realize some people get pushed out of shape here. We're not going to go into this too deep. I want you to understand this does not mean that you can live a life of unrepentant sin and still be assured of heaven. Eternal security is not a license to sin. And if you think it is a license to sin, that means you don't even possess it to begin with because those who have been saved are indwelled by God, the Spirit, and they desire what God desires, and you're not going to live any way. In other words, man, a saved man, a saved woman will not sin without repenting and have a smile on their face. Face. Clearly, we got to be active. Clearly, we got to remain in the faith. But the decisive cause is not me. It's not me. Thank you, Jude, for the reminder. Rest in that, church. But he's not done. He goes on. He says, you know, not only is he going to keep us, he says, God is able to present us. Beautiful. Check it out. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory. Oh, man. Man, you ever read the word of God and it just, just sit on you and it's so sweet. And you just, it's just, this is so sweet to hear. I need to hear this often. Look at that word present. In the Greek, it literally means to be made to stand. 
You see, at this present time, if you are a believer, you're standing in grace, but there will be a future where you will stand in glory. And isn't that the ultimate goal of life? Isn't that your heart's desire to stand in the presence of the living God? What could ever surpass that? And I can't do that on my own. I sometimes hear people, I don't know, maybe it was on my vacation I heard someone talking about this, I can't remember, but, uh, you know, bucket list. And people talk about bucket list, you know, all the things they want to do before they die. I want to I want to skydive, I don't know, travel, whatever, there's these long lists. You can actually Google list of most popular things on a bucket list or whatever. But I was thinking, you know what, I, as a believer, Man, bucket lifts can be really kind of um, just an odd thing. Because you know, here's what I'm thinking. You know what I want with my life? I want to, at the end of it, to have lived it in such a way, namely by calling upon Jesus Christ to save me and working that out, I want to pass and I want to be presented standing blameless before the presence of my glorious God. I'm telling you right now... Please hear me. If, any, if, you, if you got a bucket list and it's anything other than that, you got a lame bucket list. I'm just telling you. Chris, hey, okay, so um, side note. You can thank me later or not. Listen, Christian bucket lists list should look a whole lot different than um, non-Christian bucket list. They should. Like a lot of bucket lists, we're talking about the, 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 I, I want to do that. They're really self-centered things. Here's what I want. Man, I want my bucket list. I want all of you to have this on your bucket list. What about this one? Share the gospel with a people group who have never heard it before. What I'm talking about, man. Share the gospel with everyone in my neighborhood. Because we're going to be presented by God's grace, blameless in his presence. Jesus does it. Jesus alone, not your ability, not your works, not your religiosity, not your awesomeness, Jesus. And finally, I love this one. As he, we, 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 this verse, it closes out. It says, God is able to bring great joy. Now, that's how I stated it, because it says, with great joy. Now, now it's interesting Some people have this perception that perhaps you will stand before the living God, but you're not going to do it with great joy, or you might do it um, kind of in a terrified, kind of scared way, but that's not what Scripture says. If you're a believer, if God has saved you, if God's Spirit indwells you, you are going to be presented with great joy, great joy, blameless, great joy. Come on, church. Is that not amazing? Is that not comforting? So that's the first kind of grand comforting truth we see, right? He's going to keep us. He's going to present us. And there's going to be a lot of joy. Not a little bit of joy. Great joy. Come on. That's what I'm talking about, church. But he's not done. He's not done, guys. There's one other grand comforting um, truth that he wants us to see. So, so, So we've just looked at what... God does for us. Now, verse 25, we're going to see what God receives from us. All right? You may be thinking, I don't know, man. I don't know. What's God going to receive from me? Like, 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 like what do I possess that I can bring before God Almighty? Well, church, there's really only one thing that you possess that you can bring to the living God. And here's the good news. It was the reason you were created, all right? The one thing you can give him is the one thing you were created to do. What is it? Give him your worship. That's what you can give the living God. Look at verse 25. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. In that, you see, we're going to move a little bit quicker here, but at least Four reasons that we praise and worship our almighty God. First reason is this. He says there is only one God. Church, there is only one God. He says it to the only God, our Savior. 
We need reminding of this. Hey, hey, there's only one God. There is only one God. Let me say it as clearly as I can. The triune God of the Bible is the only God. Church, there is no other. Let me kind of break it down. Your job, not a God. Your family, not a God. Your work, not a God. Your popularity, not a God. Your looks, not a God. I got a list of them. Your position, your title, not God's. Sex, money, they are not God's. Crazy thing here. They don't even claim to be a God. So we need not be bowing our knee to these things. I've said this before. One day, every one of us, this may have already happened. It may be going to happen. It may, may happen to you right now. It's definitely going to happen in the future. You will take a punch to the soul. And church, I want you to know right now, if you got your knee bowing to any of these other things, like your family or your job or your popularity or your looks, they will all fail you because they're not a God. Please do not be found in a position of bending your knees to one of those things. And, and he's reminding us, Judah's reminding us, there's only one God. Question is, here's the question. Does your life reflect it? Like, like, like let's say somebody is observing you. Would they be able to look at you and say, that is an individual that only bows their knee to one thing, the living God. But he's not done. He says there's only, what does he say? Check it out. He says, only the only God, and then he says, our Savior. Real quick, that's interesting. It's interesting because we're not accustomed to looking at God the Father as a Savior. We don't often say that, right? The New Testament, I was studying this, about 15, 16 times says Jesus is our Savior, but about eight times it also refers to God the Father as our Savior. And that is what Jude is reminding us of, of here. The source of our salvation is God the Father. John 3, 16 says, it is God the Father who sent the Son. For God so loved the world that what? He gave his only Son, okay? So first, we praise him, we worship him for his exclusive deity, all right? He's gonna move on. Two, we worship him because he saves us through, look at this, Jesus. Right? He's the only God. We worship him. We worship him because he saves us. That's what it, through Jesus, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? So God the Father is the source. God the Son, Jesus is the mediator. He does this interceding work. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his sitting in glory, the focus is on Jesus. Judah's reminding us that salvation is through Jesus. And man, we worship him. That's what, hey, that's what we gathered here to do today, right? We're here to worship him. He keeps going. We worship him because he has all the power. Look at this. He stacks these adjectives. Be glory and majesty and dominion and authority. Mm, man, we could do a sermon on this, but I'm going to break it down really quickly. Glory. Glory is the sum total of all that is God and all that he does. Everything about God is glorious. Majesty. That talks about his greatness, his worthiness. Guys, he's not simply the king. He is the king of kings. He's not simply the Lord. He is the Lord of lords. Next, dominion. That means he is sovereign. He rules over all things. There is nothing that he does not rightfully stand over and rule. Then it says authority. That means he has the absolute right. He has the absolute right to use this power. Glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. Church, that is our God. Finally, he says we worship him because he is, look, eternal. Before all the time, before all time, and now and forever, amen. I love it. Like, guys, that is so comforting, is it not? Like, 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 like how long is he going to be the only God? Forever? How long is he going to have all the power? Forever? How long is he going to be on the throne? forever so yeah you find yourself and not worrying about all these things maybe you want to get some NyQuil 
put the knock wheel up, man. Read Jude 24 and 25. It's so comforting. And then, I know it's been a rough book, guys. It's a short book. It's been rough. He ends it with one word. Amen. Amen. Simply means, that's it. So be it. It's the way it is. Amen. Amen. And I say, right on. Right? right on. Come on, we're going to sleep. That's an encouraging doxology. Church, it matters what you think. It matters what you think. We want our thoughts on God to match as closely as possible the actuality of God. There has been false teachers. There are false teachers, but we want to be good theologians. It won't always be popular. It won't always be easy, but we want to contend for the faith. Now, as we're closing out, I want to do one final thing. I want to share something with you. Um, I spent some time the last couple of weeks studying some early church history because here was my question. I want to share this with you. Some of you will appreciate, I think all of you will appreciate what I'm about to say. I hope so. My question was this, as we've closed out the book of Jude. What happened to Jude after he wrote this letter? That was my question, okay, in my head. So I thought I'd spend some time trying to study this. And um, I actually spent too much time, and so uh, I'm going to share some of it with you. So, um, so let me just, just, there's a few things we can gather. Let me just, let me just go through this real quick. In 1 Corinthians 9, 5, you can write this down. We're told by Paul that Jude was a, and James both were preacher, missionaries, and they traveled around. Now, here's the interesting thing. The Word of God tells us he had a wife. I want you to just think about that. Jude had a wife. Okay, now here's my thinking. If the man's got a wife, he might have had children, okay? So is there any first or second century historical documents that would attest to Jude having any children. Well, um, no. <laughs> but there is something said about his grandchildren. And I want to share this with you. This isn't Bible. This is early church history. You can look it up. A man by the name of Hygesippus, he was a early 150, somewhere in there, church historian. Here's his account. I'm actually going to read it to you because I want you to see this. But... Um, there was this really evil emperor called Domitian. He was really the first Roman emperor to start persecuting the church. And he's killing the church. He's martyring people, right? He's doing all this stuff. He's actually the emperor who had John expelled to Patmos. He had a niece that became a believer, and he expelled her. Now, that's all history. We know that. There's other documents supporting that. But according to this early church historian, the emperor, Domitian, Ask, is there anyone related to Jesus? Because I'd like to talk to them. I want to know more, okay? And so it was made known to him that Jesus had two, what would that be, great nephews that were still living. And so they got these two men, Jude's grandsons, and brought them before the emperor. You can write this down too. This is Eusebius. The book is called Church History. It's book 3, chapters 19 and 20. I'm going to read some of it to you. Um, once again, this isn't Bible. This is church history. Let me just read this to you. I want you to see this church, his grandchildren. I'm just reading it. It's been translated. I'm reading the translation. And he, that's the emperor, you got these two men, asked them, that's Jude's two grandsons, if they were descendants of David and they confessed that they were. Then he asked them how much property they had, how much money they owned. And both of them answered that they had 9,000 denarii and half belonged to each of them. So half to each. And the property did not consist of silver but a piece of land which contained only 39 plethora. And from that they raised their taxes and supported themselves. So what it's saying here, in other words, is these are just common guys, all right? There's nothing special about them. And you can read on. It says this is really interesting. It says, at that point, they showed the emperor their hands, and it exhibited calluses, right? And so he could see that they were poor and they worked hard, all right? So these are men who worked hard and loved Jesus. Now the emperor is going to ask them about Jesus. Check this out. 
This is according to Eusebius. And when they were asked concerning Christ and his kingdom, that's the first question, of what sort it was, that's the second question, and when it would appear, that's the third question, they answered. And they contended the very thing their grandfathers told all of us to do. Here's what they said. They said, it's not a temporal nor an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly and angelic one, which would appear at the end of the world when he should come in glory to judge the quick and the dead and give unto everyone according to his works. Guys, these guys were good theologians. They knew their Bible. They were ready to contend. They're before a man that would kill them. They're before a man who was persecuting the church, yet they boldly contended for the faith. According to this early document, they're good theologians. Now check this out. Upon hearing this, Domitian did not pass judgment against them. It says, but he despised them because they were of no account. They're poor. They're of no account. He lets them go, and check this out, and then he puts a decree out to stop all the persecution of the church. That's amazing. It's amazing. He stopped the persecution. Now, we do know this from history. Domitian did stop persecuting the church. Now, whether or not this was the decisive reason or not, I don't know. But according to this early church historian, it was one of, if not the reason, he stopped persecuting the church. In addition, other documents tell us this. It's at this time he allows his niece to return to the empire. Second thing we're told, different documents tell us this. At this point, John, who's on Patmos, was allowed to return to Ephesus. There's other documents supporting that as well. Now, all of this, there's not a lot of documents supporting all of this stuff. I don't know. All I'm saying is we have this account. Here's what I want us to see before we end today. Here's what I want us to know, right? It appears from this historical document that Jude's two grandsons were brought before a wicked emperor who's persecuting the church, and they boldly contended for the faith. And as a result of that, the church was blessed. My prayer has been and is that we will be a people who are just like this. That in the midst of persecution, when it is very difficult that you and I would be good theologians, that we would proclaim lovingly and kindly the goodness of our God, and that we would contend for the faith. Church, it matters. It matters.